this is Roxy at Rox Sanicinix Art and Three Gear Studios. I'm recording for Three Gear Studios today. And this is our August How to Paint series. And we're going to be painting a water lily this time. And I decided I would start with covering an area that I had not covered before in any of my teaching videos. And that has to do with actually getting that initial drawing onto your canvas. Uh, there are many ways you can do this. One is just to put up your canvas on an easel, look out at a scene, and just get your paintbrush and start painting, usually sketching out some things. It's good to plan the composition beforehand. But there's many other ways that artists do this and have done this over a very long period of time. And one of the ways that they have done this, um, this started, I think, in the round. Oh, I can't remember. There's a book. Let me tell you about this book if you are interested in transferring, because one of the things that they've done, and they have done research, and there are people who believe that little pre-Renaissance or in that area in general, that art changed dramatically and got a way more realistic. And there are people that, and, the, and increasing evidence that they've, the artists then used actual projections, kind of like a slide projector or an overhead projector to project sometimes the portraits, sometimes just like the background of Paris or something. And there was the um, camera Lucia that they used, which is a projection system. It doesn't have a permanent photograph. And uh, oh, there was another one before that. I can't remember, but this guy, David Hockney, this is a book. If you're in, it's backwards, I know. You have to get a mirror because uh, when I point the camera this way, that's what happens. But it's David Hockney, and he wrote this. It's called Secret Knowledge. And in this book, they have evidence of different kinds of very rudimentary project projection systems that they have, um, he, he is working on proving this theory that the old masters and all of these fantastic painters in the past often use projections for at least part of their painting. It's quite interesting. <laughs> so that's one way you can transfer an image, whether you're using a projection in a live image or having a, a photograph. And there are different ways that, of, of tracing and stuff. And whether you're tracing to make something a different scale, there's different instruments you can use rather than just drawing. I'm going to set this book aside. And tell you about a couple of methods that I've used in the past that are very effective and aren't too difficult. One of the things is when I was, um, uh, this is an example of a drawing. One of the things you can do is a drawing. And especially if you're making stuff up, this was a model. It is a nude, but it's a modest. I call this modest nude because she's not actually showing anything intimate. <laughs> but it, I, it was a class and I did the drawing. Then I took the drawing well, on this one, I, 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 what I wanted to do is transfer this drawing to my canvas because honestly, it's a lot easier to draw and make corrections on a piece of paper with a pencil or charcoal than it is directly on a, a bumpy canvas. It's hard to erase. It's hard, you know, to, to really get it how you want it initially. It's, it's harder than paper, especially if you're very familiar with drawing with a pencil on paper. Or charcoal. So what I would do is I would do the drawing and then I'd make a photocopy of the drawing and then I'd get charcoal and I'd put it all over the back essentially making carbon paper and then I'd lay that down on my canvas and with a ballpoint pen I would trace around the major shapes. This is very helpful especially if you're doing a live model that's coming back over and over and over. These were six week sessions so once a week, she'd come and try to assume the same position. And, um, you know, people are, are, they don't assume exactly the same position. They try, you just, you know, little pieces of masking tape on the floor where to put her feet or her hands or whatever. But um, having that initial drawing and then transferring it to your canvas with, with the ballpoint pen, what it would do is it would transfer the, the charcoal on the back onto the canvas. And then you could sit there and fill in all the details. This is the final painting I did of that same lady. And you can see there's a lot of nuances and everything. It's, it's not just like a coloring book by any means. 
So that's, that's a very good way of transferring. However, there is the case where you want to expedite the whole system, or maybe you don't have access to all the information you need, or maybe you set up a still life, that, but maybe you can't keep it up or, or want to explore a lot of options. And that's where the camera can get very, very handy. I'm going to put these aside. One time I was doing a still life and I set up a, a, a you know, an arrangement and then I took pictures of it. Then I moved to another side and then I changed the arrangement. Then I took pictures of it and back and forth and back and forth. And then I looked at all the pictures and selected the one I wanted to use. And sometimes I go back and move some stuff like I'm like this, except for I want that bowl a little bit more this way or something. So that's a good way to see a range of things. And then it's like, why do I need to draw this? I've got these pictures. So you can just take that photograph and you can put your charcoal on the back and get your ball of point pen and trace it on the canvas. Now, the disadvantage of this is that you have to have it the same scale to do that because it's a direct transfer. And one way that you can get around this, well, if you have a photocopy machine that larges its drinks, you can do that. But there's another better way that um, this became quite evident to me one day I was I was in a class. This is when I was first really learning to paint and or paint, learning again. My grandmother taught me when I was 10, but when I was, um, I don't know how old I was. It was a while back. I decided to start taking some classes and I, um, I was painting from a four by six photograph that I had posed. I had taken some boys out to a pond and I had posed them. I take a lot of pictures of them fishing and with the sun shining on the lake and there were um, weeping willow trees with their, you know, leaves coming down in the foreground. And it's, you know, I planned it all and I went out and I took these pictures. And when I went to paint it, I had a 28 by 42 canvas. That's a pretty big canvas. And I was sitting there looking at this picture and I was sitting there looking at this giant canvas and I was saying, how do I know where to put their heads? How do I know how big their heads are gonna be? I didn't know where to start because the boys were kind of, they weren't exactly in the middle, but they weren't on the edge. If you can start on the edge, you know, but there was a lot of information here that were simple flower or something would be different. So my teacher said, why don't you use a grid? And so the grid system is an excellent way to transfer your information from whatever you're doing onto the canvas at any scale you want. You can have a giant canvas and that's the beauty of it. So today I'm going to show you how to do that and how to do it without math because I've seen people struggling. Let's see, I want to divide this into 10 equal segments and, and I don't know how much, how big each segment's going to be. And they're sitting here trying to calculate and it's like, ugh, hurt my brain. My left brain and my right brain don't mix very well together. It's like, be on one side, be on the other side. Of course, I had to do that in architecture all the time. I, for those who know you, you know I was an architect for 30 years, and that's where you have to get the creativity, and then you have to get the actual structural engineering, and you have to meet the two together. But you actually do it in stages. So you do all the creative stuff first with that knowledge in your head that you're going to have to support this. And then you go out and figure out those details later when you're, you know, with the dimensions and the engineering. You know, you that day you do left brain work. <laughs> you leave the right brain work for the idea part. Anyway, so when I start a painting like this, well, this first part, I'm going to tell you, I do it for every painting I that I use photograph for. If I'm out in the field just painting them, I still plan it out. I... Can you see here, I have made, I've talked about this before, I've made a, a tic-tac-toe board, basically. And what it is, is it's divided in thirds. You know, this is upside down, sorry. <laughs> um, I've divided it in thirds horizontally and vertically. And this gives you some major um, demarcations by which to create a good composition. And what I've done here, the, the, when you do this, you want the center of interest actually in this 
this, this, or this. These are called the sweet spots. But you don't want four, you know, symmetrically. You want to pick one. Also, it's your strong verticals and your strong horizontals are best laid in these areas. And you can see this is all kind of not always literal, but you can see this, this flower here. It's not, if it were dead in the middle, the painting would be kind of dead. It would just be too symmetrical, boring. But here we have this, this vertical line running through here. You have this vertical petal dropping down here. You have the base of this flower, that important base right at the sweet spot. When this is this darkening bark, this is the bloom. And it all follows this vertical line that is that third division. And there is a kind of rough line here where these lily pads are. And then this line hits that bottom of the lily and then comes over here. So you can see that's a little more abstract idea. This one is secondary to this. You do have one of the things that creates a center of interest is the contrast between dark and light. And you can see there's dark here and light here. And so this is a very secondary thing and you don't want it to compete with this area because this is your really center of interest. Another thing to consider when you're laying out your painting, and all these things are critical because if the painting doesn't work on this, at the number one thing you do, this is where you establish this, this composition, this, this proportion. This, it makes a good start for your painting. And if you don't have it, it's like building a building with a poor foundation. It's just going to be a disaster. So you can see that um, there's, this is, there's a high degree of contrast. You don't have the whole thing mid-tones. That would be like looking at mud. You have the, the light areas, and I'm not even talking about color here. I'm talking about the light areas. One nice thing about this composition too is diagonals make things more interesting. And you can see because of the, the lily pads and the flower, there is a, a sense of a diagonal here. And diagonals make things more active. And that's a good thing. I like activity. I, I'm just an active person. So I don't like things that are too placid. This is Horizontal lines are, are very placid, like a beautiful, peaceful landscape, you know, but you don't want it so peaceful that people look at it and go to sleep. <laughs> but anyway, so you do have that, but you have the dark and you have the light and you have the midtones and there's a nice balance of that. So, so that works to make this an interesting picture. Now we add some color. Contrasts and color also help make it interesting and help make the um, differentiate between those um, elements and also help define a center of interest. So this is on paper, so the color isn't as bright here, but you can also see I've laid this out with a grid. But you, you can see that the color color makes difference. And to have the color in more than one spot, this is a, a, a pink flower and this lily pad has a lot of that kind of pink purple in it and then the, the water is a very very deep blue with a little reflection here so it makes a, a peaceful but um, interesting picture now the couple of critical things if you're doing a grid the proportions of the picture have to match the proportions of the canvas. Here's my canvas. I toned it. I don't know if you cut my video detoning the canvas, but I basically put some um, blobs of, um, it was burnt sienna on there, and then I poured paint thinner on it, and then I just kind of rocked it back and forth around. I, I, I mushed it around with a paper towel first, and then I let it set. So it's dry now. I have You have to do that in advance because you can't do this on a, a wet canvas. So I did that a couple days, maybe it was yesterday. It was a day or it dries pretty fast because mineral spirits dry pretty fast. But um, the grid here is done with no measuring, no math. Can you believe it? And what you have to have, the proportions have to be the same 
And the grid has to be the same. Because that way you can say, let's see, where does this lily start, you know? Line. And you can each one of these lines and say, you know, this point is about a little less than a quarter down this line. This, this line is all the way on here, but just outside, you can see the little shape of these little um, triangles here. And so you know that line comes down like that. And you can look at, this is too dark for you to see, I think, but um, kind of, the blue is harder to see, but you can see that this square ends right there. And this line here where this lily pad ends, it's, it's not halfway between here. It's about um, a little more than a third of the way. So you do have to use judgment in where is this point along this line? And that's where make your little mark and it just helps you know where things are located and what size they are. So you've gone for all this work to lay this thing out and then you want it to turn out right. You don't want this flower to end up here because you didn't put it the right place. You know this way it'll be. There. So this grid is constructed very very simply and I'm going to demonstrate. Oh, oh, just one more thing about proportions. One reason I know that this is the same proportion is this is 8 by 10. It's a very handy size to print out in because it fits on an 8.5 by 11 piece of paper. Now, if you take a standard, many photographs are like more of a uh, 4 by 6 proportion, and they will come out to be, if you put set them at 10 inches, they come out to be, um, I think, around 6 and 3 quarters. I can't remember exactly. So you have to make adjustments. But you can always crop the picture to meet... I know that if 8 by 10 is the same proportions as a 16 by 20, just double the numbers, you know, 2 times 8 is 16, 2 times 10 is 20. So this is a 16 by 20. That was easy. There are proportional scales and things which I'm not going to go into now, but they can help you see what the proportions are. Photoshop and other Photo processing programs often tell you I'm familiar with Photoshop Elements, which is basically Photoshop for uh, dummies, not um, <laughs> people who are professional graphic artists or photographers. <laughs> it's kind of a, a small version of Photoshop. It's much more affordable, too. It's called Photoshop Elements, and I hope it's still available because mine is from 2012, but it still works great. So. What you do, I'm going to show you now how you construct this easy to construct grid with no math. First, you need to get your tone canvas and a charcoal pencil. You don't want to use pencil on your canvas. It's just, I've always been told that by numerous art teachers. I've never tried it, so <laughs> they just said, don't do it, so I listened. But charcoal works fine. I think it's something to do with the oil in the graphite doesn't, the paint doesn't always adhere correctly when you've used it. That's my theory. So what you do is first you make an X. I'm using a T-square, kind of remnants of being an architect, but it also is very handy for drawing straight lines. Drawing the lines perpendicular to the edge of your canvas, because you, you can see if you put it right here, this line it's going to be perpendicular to this line. And it's just easier than, than, you know, making a mark here and mark there and then trying to lay it out even. So it's very handy. This is, I think, a, a, this 36-inch T-square, so it's good enough for most paintings. So first, I'm hoping you can see this. I tried to put my camera so that you could. I could try getting a little closer here. So what you do, first you make an X. So you line up your edge, allowing just a little bit for the edge of the pencil. You see, I've just put it from corner to corner and I'm making, I don't want to make the line too heavy or if you make your lines too heavy, then your grid can be hard to cover up sometimes and you don't want that. I used an extra soft 4B charcoal pencil, which is good because it, you can um, erase your grid when you don't need it anymore better with that. So now I'm drawing the other side of the X. So I have an X. Ta-da! Can you see it? I don't know if you can see it. It's not real heavy. It's an X. 
So the nice thing about an x is it tells you exactly where the middle is. So you get your t-squared, and you line it up with the middle, and you draw a vertical line and a horizontal line, which meet at the middle. This is why the t-squared. Now, if it's not, I got missed a little bit. If you're a little off, don't worry about it. It's close enough. This doesn't have to be like engineering perfect. It just have to be art perfect. So now you have, geez, I don't know if you can see this with the light and everything. Ta -da! You have that, see how I missed it? Anyway, what you have here is four boxes, four rectangles that are all the exact same proportion as the big one. So then you do it again. You go from corner to corner. And so what you want to do is go to corner to corner. These lines are going to be parallel with a, um, one of the lines of the X. What you're doing is you're taking all those four little boxes and making them, putting X's in them. That's all. So there's two of them are done. So you've already got half the X there because it was the bigger box X. Each of the four smaller boxes that the bigger box created now have X's in them. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm trying. <laughs> anyway, they, so you have four boxes, each of X in them. So guess what you do now? Take your T-square. Like I said, you can use a ruler, but then you have to be sure it's straight and everything is pink. But this makes it easier because you have a center of an X right here and a center of an X right here. So even if you're just using a ruler, you can line up that ruler on those centers. And you just draw a line there, a vertical line, from the center of your X to the center of your X. And like I said, if it doesn't line up perfect, life isn't perfect, but it's closer. So now I'm going to draw the horizontals. Now I'm getting some your light is creating a shadow, sometimes it's hard to see exactly where you're going. <sighs> so, now I created 16 boxes. Oh, you can see they all have a diagonal line. There's one box. Do you see here? There's four boxes down. And there's four boxes across. And each one has one diagonal in it. I can't tell if you can see that. I can't see it very well from here on my phone, but you know, I'm hoping you can. So now what you're going to do is do this one more time. You can keep doing this forever, get a zillion X's, but I can tell you, you can get really confused. But if you're doing a big painting, what I do with a big painting when I put a lot of these X's and boxes on here is I often will put in the side, I'll put like a one, two, three on that and on my paper so I can find myself better, kind of like a map where, you know, you have the ABC and the one, two, three and your city that you're trying to go to is set A3 or something and you can find it. So anyway, I'm going to take all these little 16 boxes and I am going to make my diagonal lines into X's. Again, and you'll see that you're going to skip every other. If you find your ears aren't parallel, then you've made a mistake. If you don't hit the corners of the boxes perfectly, you know, as, as long as it's close, it's good enough. You're going to be close enough. This is not the same as math. It's actually geometry, if you want another truth. Because geometry is all about doing math with art. When I found that out, I was good at geometry. I didn't get geometry at first. And then my father explained to me, all you have to do is draw pictures. And uh, I said, you're kidding, <laughs> really? <laughs> Suddenly I started making good grades instead of horrible grades in geometry. And I could draw pictures. Math was not my forte. But I worked hard at it. They told me I couldn't do an art. They told me at one point I couldn't be an architect, so I wouldn't be able to do math. 
But you know when people tell you you can't do something? just makes you try harder. And I worked hard and I did straight A's in structural engineering. So you can tell, I, I studied a lot. I worked hard. That paid off. Had my own firm for 30 years. So now I'm gonna check here. I think I drew the last bunch of horizontals and verticals. Can you see how this relates? See all those X's? It's the same grid. So I did draw horizontal and verticals. You can look up here at the top one. You can see there's that box and there's the X and the horizontal and vertical. So I'm gonna draw these horizontals and verticals and then we'll be done. It'll match the picture. And then you'll see how I do the drawing from this. But you can do this with gigantic canvases with little tiny pictures. And it'll tell you how big that head is and where it's located, things like that. Very, very useful. I do not lay out my paintings the same way all the time. It depends on the subject matter, complexity, the size of the canvas, and source material. When I'm doing, I did a series, for a long time I did a series of just big flowers and I would just draw a third grid like this. I just draw that third grid on there and it was close enough because I'm a plant, it's a plant, right? So, but I still wanted to be sure that the composition was, um, was there. I wanted to be sure it could, it met those points I wanted to meet it and fell into exactly where I wanted to, it to be. And sometimes you don't follow it exactly. I don't know if you can see this painting up here. It's got the light shining on it, really bright. But this is one that has a very strong horizontal right here. You can see it goes all the way across. And that is below the third point. The third point's about right here. But it didn't look right. So I put it here anyway, and it worked. So this, these are guidelines. These aren't rules, they're guidelines. And it's very important to know the difference between rules and guidelines. Because guidelines are suggestions that you can use to help yourself. Rules are things that can kill you sometimes if you don't pay attention. Like, I bring this up all the time, don't drink your paint thinner. it's easier than you think. When you have a drink on the table and you have your paint thinner on the table and you're not thinking because you're working on your painting and it's so easy to, without thinking, pick up that paint thinner and take a sip and that's to be fatal. So that's a rule. In fact, that's the strongest rule in painting that I can think of. So I just keep my water on a different table. So now I have my canvas, and I like to mount my canvas. So there's little things to put it on here and here, and these little, I don't like those because it makes me feel like my canvas is in a tunnel because it's, it's behind part of the easel. So I clamp it on right at the front because I like it right there. I'm getting a little shadow of my lamp a little. It's very important to have good light when you're painting. And I always used two lights. And what I, I have the luxury here in my studio of having three. So I have one shining. Um, see, that one shines down on my paint and my work area. I have one over there. And that shines down from one side. And then I have, you probably saw the other one, or the reflection of it. But them coming in at both angles, what you don't want is a big shadow where you're painting. And so sometimes you have to jiggle around your light. You can see the shadows here. If you're right-handed, the, the primary light is best on your left so that you're not painting in your shadow. I kind of, especially for these videos, I like them on both sides because you also have to, to see the canvas. But anyway, so here we are. And what I do is I usually start with some raw umber. Raw umber, backwards. What I'm going to do is sketch 
with raw umber. Raw umber is a gentle color. You can cover it up easily. It's semi-opaque, so you can see it. And it works. It works. So you can sketch with this. The other thing you can do is pick out the colors and sketch with the colors. But if you're just trying to get that drawing in there, then um, it's really nice to do it with something like raw umber. And I usually pick out a brush that isn't too big because I'm, I'm essentially drawing, but um, I don't like that one. What I'm, what I'm looking for is a nice filbert. I like filberts. Filberts are good. And it's kind of a small one. I usually start large. I think this used to be a filbert. It's hard to say. It's pro stroke. So it is pretty small. But the point is, See the edge? It can be it, it can be fatter and it can be thinner, but it's good for drawing because you're really drawing at this stage. And if you have a really fat brush, which you usually do for your initial painting because you're doing broad areas, but we're, right now we're really drawing. And drawing with that raw umber gives you these gentle lines. And I use medium in it. I want a very thin line and nothing too heavy. I want to be able to um to cover it up. So I'm going to take my grid here and my grid here. And because it's such an important thing, I'm going to start with the flower. It is the most important thing. And, and when you see it developing, it's easier to, to do the other relationships. I usually start on the top left because I'm right-handed and I don't stick my hand in my paint. But like when you're doing a head, I usually start, I start with the most significant thing in the painting. So the bottom of this flower doesn't quite line up with the line. But you can see that I have, these are the one, two, three, four boxes here. That's one, two, three, four boxes. And so at the top of the first line of boxes, we go over one box and it's about, it starts about it, um, at one and a half boxes over horizontally and one box and a little box over vertically. So let's find this line. So you can see it, 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 it's easy to get lost in here, but it's, it's not that hard. That's my first box. This is my second box. Now I'm in the second box. Okay, going up, there's one box. I, I, these are it's what I'm calling boxes, these initial four. They actually are each made of four boxes. But when you see the bigger picture, see that's that. This line would be this line. So if you're a little confused now, it'll get clearer as you go along. And I'm estimating, I'm looking at this diagonal, and this is just a, a little bit farther along, coming up from the bottom. It's more than half. It's probably about two thirds. It's about right there. So that point right there, I make a mark, and that is this point here. Now this kind of, it has a kind of, um, I'm looking at the lines. See, I'm looking for lines and where they intersect other lines. And I see this line. This, this right here is in the middle of the flower. See, this is why I'm starting at something significant. Because once I see the shape forming, it's a lot easier to find where you are. It's a little intimidating at first. But you can also make corrections very easily at this stage. And everything, you can just wipe it off. So this line crosses here about here. And I'm looking at where, I want to get these major petals in. Well, we've got this one right below. This is the top of it. And so I'm looking right here. They come to meet about right there. A lot of this you're estimating and, um, you know, having an eye for, um, it helps to be able to kind of see a shape and see a line and see and be able to reproduce that. And, and the grid helps, but you, 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 I mean, it's, it's like learning to paint. Some people are visual. And so this kind of thing is very much easier for some people than other people, just because if you are a visual, a visual learner, you'll, you'll um, be able to draw these shapes a lot more easily, just like you'll be able to draw. But the, the grid gives you a crutch, basically. 
I find that sometimes when I'm trying to understand something, I can't even understand it unless I can draw it. It's like, hold on, give me a pencil. You mean this? I draw a diagram. It's just so much more understandable for me. But each, each, way, each place where it crosses a line, I'm making a decision. Here's the line. Where is the center of the line? The center of the line is right here. This is a little below the center of the line. So here I am. This would be the center of the line. This is a little below the center of the line. I also want to know how far does this stick out? This flower on this one. You know, it sticks out. I'm looking at the space. Uh, something like about there. So I'm aiming for something about whoop, like that. That's a little below them. That's something like that. So, and I'm coming off of this. So I'm going to be drawing this over to there. Goes a little below. That's just a little extra that I was just dabbing there to show where the middle was. Let's get rid of that. It's real easy to erase at this point. Now this top is a little flatter. This is a little more rounded. You can certainly refine these shapes, but you're going to lose your grid eventually as you start applying your paint. Now the top of this petal, see there's my line, and half is about there. This is, looks like it's about a quarter. This distance between the bottom of this little box right here and the top of the box, you can see that the blue is bigger here than it is here. And I have this much where that blue is here. So it's a little smaller here. So it's probably a little bigger than that. And this is almost flat across here. So I'm going to go doo -doo 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 over there. And you do have to kind of like fact check your shapes. You know, if you're trying to do something, you're plotting it out and you look at it and you're trying to do a circle and you'll think, oh, that's not a circle. So you can, you know, it's good to just, just do that. Um, does it look right? Kind of check. Now this meets the other things about, that's about right there. And then this other, these other petals are coming up from this, this place here. This place right off of this line is that spot right there. And it looks like there's a little bit of space there. And then you have this, this comes almost exactly right there, this petal that goes shooting up there. And so I'm going to draw it up to there. And how far does it go up? You have this, this square and this square, or rectangle. So that's that rectangle would be that rectangle. And this was that center. And so this point hits right about there. So I'm going to make a little mark there. This is where the dot to dot comes in. Now, how wide is this panel? It looks like it's about there. A lot of it you can just measure with your eye. It's, it's, it's there and it goes to there. And this green and this green are pretty much the same size. So, and I know it's springing off of here. This is a curved line. And that's a little bit off of the center. So I'm going to try to draw a line here that kind of curves and goes up to there. That would be good. Okay, so we have that line. You can see this is, it's a little tedious, but, but it gets you started with your painting. This is why it's easier if you just trace it out. It's expedient, but like I said, if you're going to trace it and get a, get a, um, go, I mean, you can go to, um, a repro company. I know there's an ARC in Greenville. There's one in Columbia, Maryland. That's the ARC, um, which is, they bought out Maryland Blueprint during the recession. <sighs> I went to Maryland Blueprint for years for my blueprints and they stopped making blueprints. And then they changed it to NBC. Um, anyway, so much for the history of graphic reproduction. Um, there's also a petal coming down here. Now I know 
that it's, see it was in the third grid, but this is not a third grid. So where does it come down? Look in here, you probably can't see this because the blue is very dark in the picture. But this comes somewhere around here. Do, 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 do. And it starts there and it comes down. Sometimes you can just kind of say, oh man, it's easier to draw the shape than to try to figure this out. So you can see my line's a little wiggly. Not, I think that it actually comes over. Here's a good place. I mean, demonstrate how easy it is to erase. See? And if you want it even more erased, no, it, you have to realize that you're, not, you're usually erasing your grid too. But it just bugs out a little more there now. I can tell that just by looking at here, but, um, and then this other side of the petal comes about here, about here. As you do this more, it's easier to kind of get a feel for where things are on the line. And you can see you can kind of connect it here. Remember when you're drawing those long lines, try to draw from your shoulder. Don't draw from your hand. Draw from your shoulder because that's how you draw a straight line from your shoulder. Another tip from the architect. So I learned an awful lot. I, it, you know, it's interesting that all these years I was a draftsman and I got, when I started painting again, I didn't paint for 15 years because I was a working mother. That explains it. I did a lot of other stuff too, but um, just couldn't do everything. But when I started painting again after drafting for 15 years, I was so much better. And I hadn't even been painting. It was like I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. <laughs> I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> but, and, you know, your eye and your hand control and your, your just sense of space and proportion and all those things improve. So, okay, where is this end? There's one box, there's that. It's about one, a little just past one and a half boxes. So that's one and a half boxes. So it's a little beyond that. And that's another one. So it's about there. So, and um, you can look, just look at these shapes. You know, it's like, mm, it's about there. It's there. I'm just trying to get these major shapes. Once you get major shapes in, then um, a lot of it is much more intuitive. Okay. Connect the dots. And I'm headed for it over here. It's that's you might notice I'm I'm doing one end and I'm doing the other and then kind of looking at the shape and kind of trying to check where I'm at. All of these petals, or at least these ones down here, they're flatter on the top and they're more rounded on the bottom. So I'm trying to, to capture that. And a lot of it is in this area here. Where's the point? You know, to make it a little flatter on the top, I can take off a little here. And I can see you know, where, where it meets on this line. Okay, now let's go up to this one. That's where. See, looking at these little triangles is really helpful too. Because you can see the shape and the proportion. It, 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 that one's a little bit more. My, my, I can see my triangles a little off here, so. But if you, I'm just trying to think and talk. This one comes down there, this one is above, this is the bottom, so it kind of goes and then it goes up. How far does it go up? It goes up. About right there. See how thin my lines are? Sometimes when they get new thin, I just need to put a little more paint on it. And that goes up almost to the half of this. I'm talking about the half of this line. And that's a pointy. It's pretty pointy. But there's still, you know, I think this, this needs, I think I got my, 
this line isn't quite right. I think it needs to be, it needs to be farther down. I was getting my top line, my bottom line mixed up. I did, I put a little paint thinner on my paper towel because that erased it really well. Now, what I did is I, this line here, I got my top line and my bottom line mixed up. So this is just about right there, I think. And this point, looking at this triangle, you can also look at the shape, like the triangle, not just the line. I see about how much it's pointing into the triangle and the relationship there. So it's more like that. And like I said, this this is a flower. If you know, if you were to if you were really there and the wind blew, it wouldn't be in exactly this position. So as long as you get um I always tell the student of mine, it has to be believable. And that's a little more curved like this. I didn't want too fast without checking it. This one goes up a little bit. I'm really not trying to take all day doing this. Because you guys would get bored! You're not bored already. These big petals, you know, the flower is the most complex thing. And then you also have the reflections of everything, too. So, um, like this, there's this little thing coming down here. But in a way, it's a lot easier because you already have what's around it. The more information you have on here, the faster and easier it is to add information, like these reflections here. You have this one that comes down. This is this one. You have to fill them apart. And then there's one that comes down here. That's that one. Started to get two of them mixed up. Because there's one that's really well defined and there's two together. And that this one comes out just about as far as this pink one here. And it goes all the way back to about, I think it goes all the way back to here. And it gives a little shape like about there, there. It's very dark there, so it's hard to see. And then there's one below that, goes about the same way. And it goes up to about the same place. These are all real dark, but if you get the end point, this one, I can see it's going up like that, it's going up like that. And then it meets just about here. Right here. And it goes into this diagonal. It's quite broad, actually. It has a shadow in it. And then, you know what? I think even this one going down is just a reflection. It's a reflection of this little one right here. They're very interesting. Because there's also another thing coming down that actually is overlapping here, which is an opposing shadow, I think. And it goes right off the page. And that starts about right there. That's quite narrow. Here. And you have another one going down here. These are all reflections. So they'll actually end up being very light. I mean, when they're dark, but they, um, they're not as prominent. So it'll, it'll, it's going to look kind of busy for a while. Sometimes if you can't see real well, if you get the original photograph, it's easier. If you have questions about what I'm doing, just write in. I can see, you know, Lena's got a couple comments in here. But um, I'm hoping that you can see this clear enough and what I'm doing that you can follow along and do it too, whether it's now or whether it's afterwards. But it, this is a, a it, it's good to have several techniques. So when you start a painting, you know, which technique am I going to use to, to get this, out, you know, started, get this started. Now this one is going to be a lot easier here. It's kind of going down. Where is it going? The lily pads are, are really quite quite a lot easier than 
than these petals. And you can see these overlapping and composition overlapping is really good. We got overlapping all over the place here. And when you do overlap, pretend you're drawing like this line and picking it up like you're drawing it right through. Because um, if you don't do it that way, it can become disconnected. So, so like this one, I, I really need to, to draw it like that and then take off this part that's underneath that part. And that's how, like if you have a table with a base on it, that's how you have to get those two pieces of the table on either side of the base lining up. Now this is kind of weird because there's another lily pad under here. And so the edge of this one, you have to be sure you don't get lost in your edges. This one goes up, it actually goes up about like that. But by drawing, you have to draw it together so you don't get lost. And then it goes, it's going to come up about here. It gets, it's widest about there. So, about like that. And then it's going to go scooting off. It's going to end up right about there. See how it's, it's, it's good to figure out where it's going and not just go one step at a time. You go one side, the other side. That's how you like cross a log across a stream. Don't look at where you're going. I mean, don't look at the feet under you. Don't look at your next step. You have to kind of plan and be sure there's a rock there, but what you have to do, you look at the other end. You don't look down, you look at the other end. And that's kind of like drawing these. You look at the other end. Now, if you look at this and it looks a little bit too pointy, then you just round it out a little. It did look a little pointy to me. So, so that grid is an aid. You get the lot of this flowery. Once we get this flowering, the rest is relatively fast. But there's a lot of petals here, and it's easy to get lost in those petals, which is why we're using this, this crutch of the, the grid. This is just a little here. And you can make, you can change some of this too. Like maybe this is sticking out a little bit. Um, I think I might have made this a little too far because there's really not much room for this um, petal. Now I could either make the petal go over it and overlap, which would be fine, or I can just pull it back. But you don't want it just touching. That tangent is bad news. So this one goes up here. It's gonna head up there. Let's see, it crosses here and it's just a little above this line. So it's gonna go like that. Almost right on the line, but it only goes up about there. It crosses over a little and then comes down here. And it's going to end up, that's this one. I didn't finish this one. This one crosses the line here and it all ends up in the same place. And this one, it might bulge out. And it looks about right. This one is going to end up just shy of that. So it's going to be something like almost that line, then it departs and comes over here and goes down like that. One more paint. Remember, keep your paint thin. So that's a little heavy right there. Okay, and that one was there. So it's coming over here. And it's coming down. You've got a whole bunch of this quadrant. This is only about right, right there, maybe. And it only goes to a little bit past here before it disappears behind this one. Where's the most forward one? There's one here. We're, we're going to get into all these ones that are behind other ones. The point of this little, there's a fat one right here. And it's going to come down and it's going to cross here. And it's going to go... Looks like it at the edge is right there, which is almost in the middle of this line. Mm -hmm. 
just looking at this. It's just a little close to there. It's a real fat little petal. And it goes around like more like that. Because there's a real dark area there. So it's okay that I made that dark. Let's go over here. Meet in the middle. I know this is not the most fun thing. Putting on the color is the most fun thing. But if your drawing's no good, your painting's no good. Unless you're doing abstract art, which is a whole different little fish. Oh, it's just like realism. Because I can really relate to it. It makes me feel a lot of abstract. I, I guess just don't always get it. Some of it makes me feel, or some of it's very nice, but some of it just is like a pattern to me. So if you if you feel like you don't know, understand art because you don't understand abstract art, don't worry about it. At least that's my opinion. <laughs> Okay, I see that petal's going here, this petal's going here, this petal is going right next to it, and it actually joins yeah, just about there. Okay, so let's go. And then it, there's several tips here that they must be unfolding. In this picture, I can't even quite see where they all are because it Sometimes it, you just need to go back to the, you know, a clearer copy or, or just look at it on your computer. But some of this, you know, I can figure it out when I'm painting it, as long as I have an idea where things are now. Because when I paint it, I'm going to have a better reference in front of me. So I, you don't have to be totally detailed. The, the, what you want to do is locate your stuff so that you're not constantly making corrections because that's frustrating. There's another little petal. Now sometimes you might find you don't even need to paint all those little petals. But you have this big thing right in the middle there. See a lot of these they're very light and you can't see them very well. There's a little wiggly one here. This one looks like it comes down. Where does it go? And there's a shadow. This is... Some of this we're just going to have to verify when we have the clearer picture on the computer or on a, a reference photo. But like I said, we're going to get a good idea where everything is now. That one almost reaches that line, but not quite. And you have a double... Um, double effect here. In other words, um, there's a dark pink area between these petals, and I think it's one of the sides of the petal is coming over in front. So we have this line, it's that, it's the bright spot, and this is probably about here. And then they all come down here. And that looks like it comes across here, goes down, and another comes up behind it. And then you have this big one, and I think that's the last one. And it comes all the way, almost up to this line, out there. And there's something else going on in here. But like I said, so a lot of this detail in there, you'll be able to see it a lot better later on. So we don't have to get every teeny little line. And sometimes when you're putting in your, your colors and your, you know, your paint, and um, you cover all that up anyway. So you might be spending all this time painstakingly getting every detail right in your initial drawing. And then you cover it up before you even use it. So there we have pretty much that water lily. And got that here. So now we can just get in these um, these big lily pads. This is gonna go a lot faster because they're not as little tiny things all bunched together. And if they're not exactly right, as long as they connect, 
like I said, if you have one that enters, they have to enter uh, overlap and come out with connecting lines so that you don't have, you know, your table here, your, you know, going like that. This is a little heavy here, what I just drew. I'm just gonna lighten it up a little. One thing actually, I lighten it up here now. One thing you need to be aware of is paint comes in different densities. And if, it, if, it's, if you are having a struggle with too much of these lines showing through or the grid showing through, white is opaque. And sometimes you have to cover it with white or something mixed with white. One of the issues here that you need to be aware of, greens, most of this is a really whitened sap green. Sap green is transparent, so you can't cover with it. But the white is opaque. And because they're so light, you know, even in the color, it's, this is much more saturated color. This is my photograph. You can see there's a lot of white in the green. And there's a lot of white in the pink. And a lot of the pinks are also transparent colors. So that white is going to help us cover up these lines. And that's okay. But it's good to go into it with that knowledge. Okay, let's get this little cut finished up. Let's see, that's that corner. I'm working over here on this side. And I'm just kind of seeing where it's not helpful. This is coming up to about there. See cross it is here, right there. So this goes up here, up here, and then crosses that line maybe there. And comes up to almost. Yep. See, it's just like a dot to dot. And there's a very heavy shadow here. So what I really would like is the bottom of the lily pad. And, and this is where sometimes your, your photograph, you can just see the clarity is better. Because what you have on this dark one, this dark kind of pinkish purple one, you can't see it on the paper copy. But the actual bottom of the lily pad almost touches these things. So if I know where these things are, these little things like that, it's going to make it a lot easier. So let's go up here. That's your big square rectangle. And there's your, um, that's one, that's two. This line here is this line here. So we have that darkness starting here. And here it's more than halfway up, so it's about there. And then this point here looks like it's about right there. It comes down to about there. So we've got something going on kind of like this. And then it goes up to maybe like that. And then it goes over ooh, here. And then up here. Ooh. Kind of fun. Blah. down and then up and I can see on this corner it goes kind of like that like I said it's not perfect you can always correct it in the next but you know about where you are you know all oh, that big pointy thing is there this pointy thing might be a little more pointy but it's there and this this bowl kind of of the um, this actually comes kind of like that. You can't see it, unfortunately, where we are here, but that goes kind of like that. And then this kind of emerges from here and goes up to here. That's the bottom of the lily pad. And then you have this big dark shadow. You have this, well, we didn't draw the top of that. The shadow is kind of really cutting into it. So this point, I've made a little line here and it's just kind of going like that. That's that shadow, and then it takes up down here. This is part where 
Where does it end up? This is there. That is like the reflection of it. And it's like that. Ooh. And then it goes like that. So we need to connect this. It kind of goes down, way down here. So it kind of goes like that. More or less. Kind of a little bit bulgier there. But that's just the shadow. But the shadow is really dark, so it is a significant thing. And you can see there it joins about there with this little pointy thing. And it probably goes up a little bit more like that. And then, oh, you have a tangent here. See how this lily pad, I hope you can see this. This lily pad, this is important. The, the lily pad comes down here and hits of the petal here. And it just like rides right along it. That's a tangent. That's horrible composition. So what we want to do is change it. We want to bring this lily pad down so it definitely goes behind this petal and not tangent to this petal. And you can do that because this is a painting, so you can change things if you want. So we, we started up here, let's see, this was this funny purple lily pad and it was just, just wandering up here somewhere. It's actually bulgier than that, okay? And it just about hits up here. I'm gonna finish this off and then it goes down here. So it's kind of like, and it curves out there more and goes down here. But this is a good opportunity to change things. And it's a lot easier to change things before you put all the color on there. So what we want to do is overlap this. This is almost a tangent here too. This one, this one comes out from behind, but then it, this is a weird shape lily pad. I'm gonna just, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna bring it all the way out here, come cutting through here. And then I'm gonna bring it out on this side here. So that line is like that. It's gonna go underneath that, but when you draw it consistent through, it's helpful just to get it lined up. And now I have overlapping here, I have overlapping here, and even though it's not exactly like that here, I don't care. Let's go up here to draw this more. And there's sometimes there's little things here that you want, and sometimes you don't want. There's some little debris and stuff in this painting. I don't know what this is here. This is water on the lily pad, which is important. But um, if you look here, some of these are shadows, but some of this is like some just there. This might be a leaf that kind of stuck in there, which you can add. It adds an interesting little bit of color. Where the water is on the purple one, it makes it much redder there. And that relates to this red which relates to that red. So that might be important to put in because you have these reds that you want consistent. Over here, there's a, um, a really strange kind of something going on. It almost looks like there's a lily here that's cut into that lily pad. That's the kind of thing you can put in if you want, but you don't have to put in. And it's a danger to put in things that you don't understand what they are because they might just make everybody confused. If you don't understand them and you're painting them, <laughs> one, you might not paint them correctly. So if somebody does know what it is and you painted it wrong because you didn't understand what it was, then they're going to say, oh, that looks stupid. But um, it just, it's not necessary. You know, painting things that you just look like a funny glob. Why? So you don't have to paint those if you don't want it to. It's up to you. And you can change stuff like the overlapping thing. Okay, so we need to kind of finish up this up here. There's another kind of piece of lily pad up here, which goes kind of like that. It's just on the corner. And what's interesting is one thing that's interesting is where they 
curl up on themselves. And this has a funny little point on it, which is kind of cute. And then there's another lily pad here that goes spinning around right off. I'm going to draw that right off the canvas because this isn't even my grid. Okay. Right here, again, you're almost tangent with the edge. What number is that? If you put a frame on this, that's going to be covered up. But you don't want that tangent, so I'm just going to take it right off the edge of the pane. Let's see, that's my, that rectangle happens right here. So I just made it this big. This comes down here. And that's a strange thing. Oh, I know, see, it's curving up. This lily pad here, which starts over here somewhere, back around here, comes around here, not quite there, goes scooting off down here, and comes over. It meets just past here. See, I can straighten out this curve. And there's a little pointy thing here. She comes off this diagonal about maybe here is that where that meets it right there. These are these cute little pointy things. I think they're cute. And then it comes down here. Uh oh, we have another tangent. We're gonna get rid of that. So again, when you find those tangents, just do a little overlap. So oh, that's all I'm close. So I want this one to go under that one. This one needs to go over that one. This one needs to go under that one. But it needs to go, ugh, that's not right, because it, it needs to go under this big one. And what I mean by need, it doesn't really need to, except that I want it to. The other thing I do is just separate it. So it's going to be hard to get it under there. It has to go under there if you want that water showing and then under there. And then they have this little puddle of water over here. It's kind of going like that. These puddles of water are going to be real interesting to paint. This looks like a little hand. That is in the wrong spot. And the only reason I care is that the lily pad, the structure of the lily pad is where are the low spots. This line, I just drew it too far up here into this little segment because this line here, well, maybe I did it right. That line is that line. This is where you can get lost. Okay. Yeah, it looks like a little hand to me. A little fist. That's this little, <laughs> right there, it looks like a little fist to me. Where is it? It's a nice You could actually make it a little fist and have funny little things going on in your paint. <laughs> but some of these water globs, you can add them in later or if you just want to know where they are. Sometimes it's just helpful. To have at least a sense, you know, oh, that's a little thing. I can make it look a little more like what it looks like here or whatever. And there's a little thing down here. It goes kind of be doopy up like that. Those are just, a lot of these little things, they're really not that important, but they do make the whole painting more interesting. You know what, this, this, and... And this thing up here, the same lily pad. It's got, you know how they sometimes have this split in them? That's what it is, there's a split in it. So this split goes off here. It's a little straighter than that. And then it comes, and oh, there's some overlapping going on here. Oh, that's right. And there's this thing comes around. See, this is all one lily pen. And this is just this little thing sticking on top of it. It has a little shadow there that I didn't put in here. But shadow is pretty significant, but it comes up about there. 
And if you want to take those shadows and you know color them in a little like that, that's fine. You'll you'll darken them up later. But um, this is just the underside of the lily pad. You can hardly see it right now, but it's there. Anyway, so we have a funny thing going on right here, and what it is. It, it, here it almost looks like a little thing of fabric going around, but it's the combination of a shadow and the curling up of the lily pad. Okay, so I'm just looking at it where I can see it better here. I'm cross-referencing it with my, my grid here. So it starts, but I don't want to make it look like it's not that kind of curl. It starts here, and it goes down to, and then the lily pad is actually curling up like this. And this below is the shadow of that curl. And this is what I'm saying about understanding what you're painting. Because if you, you, you might not paint that right if you don't understand what you're looking at. And then that lily pad comes around down there. So we have that. There's a little blobby something here. I don't know what it is. So I talked to you about. But, you know, just having plants are irregular. They're not like totally regular. And if you make them too uniform and one color and don't make those flaws, they just don't look real. But we can add a lot of those. There's some more curling going on here where, you know, the edge of the lily pad is kind of going like that. And it's, it's a little hard, especially in a photograph, to see the line of the underside of the lily pad as opposed to the shadow of the line. And there's some deterioration in that lily pad right between the curls right there. So we're just gonna try to get this in a little bit. There's some of this like yucky things going on here. And then you get this little arc here, which is one of those curls. And then the underside of the light pad shoots up. Actually, it goes about here. But the problem is you, you can't see this very well in the, um, the, the grid version, because there's shadow here too. And then there's another little pad underneath it. So what we have is another curl here. I need to get these curls. This is this is here. This comes out just side of that, right about there. And it shoots down. We're gonna just draw the shadow first because we can see it better than the curl. And this actually is part of the same lily pad. It's just kind of messed up in here. In here, there's stuff going on. It's like credit up. But you've got this curl goes down here. So I think that goes about like that. And then you have the upper part. Almost done here. Have a little patience. This is the shadow. And then the top goes up to about. It's a nice arc. And it actually goes all the way down to around in there. So what have I missed? There is this lily pad here. It hasn't ended anywhere. There's this leaf thing in there. There's that leaf. The leaf is right about in here. And it kind of goes like this. And it's irregular up here and it cuts back around in there. And this lily pad, it is actually, this is that one that I was trying to make more overlapping and it actually goes to about here. So I'm gonna to redraw that. So that's the one that goes underneath here. See, it is to make corrections. If you painted that all in green and everything like that, it might've been a lot harder to correct than it is at this stage. 
And that's that, that little neat thing in there that it looks all messy. Okay, now let's stand back, take a look, see what we forgot. Not everything's perfect, but we're going to go over this. And you've got, you have little bubbles and things you can add in. And there's some shadows and things. But we basically have the structure of it. All this is a big lily pad right here. And if you put this little doozy thingy, you know, little, there's little thingies here and there. But don't worry about them. So now it's blocked out. Yeah, that took a while, didn't it? Yep. Took, a, well, with all the explanation, I think the actual grid took about an hour, which in the whole big picture of your painting isn't really very long. So now what we're going to do is start putting in the lightest lights and the darkest darks. You can worry about color some in this stage. Sometimes I go ahead and like, I'll make the lightest light. It's actually a very pale pink and I'll go ahead and make it pink at this stage since this um, burnt umber, it's actually raw umber. I have to listen to what I'm saying. Um, I need to listen to what I'm saying. Raw umber. The raw umber is wet, of course. So if I start putting light pinks and things on top, they're going to get blended with the raw umber. So at this point, it's best to start with the darks because raw umber is kind of dark. So the darks will start defining things for me. And when I come to like a very dark green, I'm not going to make it like black. I'm going to make it dark green. And we also can start filling out some of this water area because it's just kind of very, very uniform. And it's interesting with the color because it's very saturated in this picture. And I took this picture. It's not an over-enhanced magazine picture or something like this. So um, it was pretty early in the morning. It's amazing how dark the sky is in the water. Reflections in water are darker than their source. You can really see that here where you can see these are, these shadows are way darker. Shadows in general are way darker. When you got a shadow on water, the reflection is darker. Like you can see here, the, the, the reflections of the lily pads are more muted and darker. I mean, the lily flower than the flower itself. And that's a, a kind of rule of thumb for reflections. They're generally darker, except for when the sun hits of course, they're probably darker than the sun because the sun is so bright we can't even look at it without burning up our eyeballs. So anyway, um, this color here, I like I said, looking at, I'll have to check it on the computer. But one thing you can do when you're trying to figure out which blue is that is mix it with a little white. And you can kind of see the color better. And I've done that here because I was kind of trying to decide what kind of blue it is. I'm trying to I, what I have is a Prussian blue here, and I have an ultramarine blue here. And they're, they're different, and you can see the difference more when you add a little white. You can see that. See, that's a different color of blue. I'm going to use a different color. You can't tell when they're just this little bob but you can really see the effect of the try to get it the same kind of density the same amount of white added in hoping you can see this yeah now it's getting much clearer see the See the difference? Oh, not where the light is. There. Can you see see the difference in the two colors of blue? Now they, they're they're whiter here than they are in the water. But then I look at the water itself. And you say, well, it's not exactly either one. Now water is almost a little purple, but it looks like it's closer to the ultramarine. But I think it might have some, actually, a lizard and crimson in it, a little bit of purple. So I'm going to start with trying to, um, fine. 
The best way to mix, learn to mix colors is by just doing it. Grab a brush, put in something. So I'm going to start with some pretty dark ultramarine blue. Now I, I keep your early paints thin. And I'm going to add a little red, glycerin. Yeah, let's let's see what it looks like on here. It's pretty darn dark. Might be a little too much red. Might a little white. You can mix right on the canvas, especially if you're experimenting. You can see it's so thin now, the canvas color's coming through. It's still a little bit off. But what you do, I call it poke at it. You know, you mix some and you look at it and you try it out. You know, it might need a little Prussian mixed in it. Of course, I'm trying to match the photograph, which might not match the computer. But I'm just taking my ultramarine and I'm mixing in a little Prussian and a little alizarin. I'm going to try it out. And it needs some more Prussian. It's, it's just a lot of this is experience. Look at it and you go, hmm. But the Prussian makes it, it's actually a little bit greener. This isn't a very big brush. You could probably use a bigger brush. It still looks like it needs more Prussian. It just has this sense of greenness that I'm missing. And you know, I might even not get it perfect right now. It's kind of thing, it'd be nice, but not necessary to have everything right the first time. It's just really nice because you don't have to tweak it. I mixed a whole bunch of Prussian in it. Let's see what we get now. I went to a bigger brush. I think it needs more white. It's a little dark. Sometimes you're going to want to um, change it anyway because yeah, it's not so much changing it, but um, when you first put it on, sometimes it, you, you want it thicker later. I think it, it keeps thinking that it needs a little more crushing. And I'm just doing this because it's a big area. I mean, there's a lot of little dark areas I could, but basically everything is laying on top of the water. So if you can get that water in early, it's just... But I need more Prussian. And like I said, you can use phthalo blue instead. I just like Prussian. Actually, my phthalo blue is so bright, 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 bright. Maybe I should try it. <laughs> um, and the Prussian is, it's a very, very much the same color, but not quite as bright. And sometimes that phthalo I have is too bright. But this is pretty saturated. Let's see what this does. I, this might be a little light. See, it is lighter, but I've got all this paint on it. And the nice thing about oil paint is you can mix it right on the canvas. It's getting a lot better now. The color. See, I'm looking at it, it still looks a little darker. Maybe a little black in it. Maybe I'm not going to worry about it, especially right now. See, all of this is um, going to be shadow right there. So it really, if I overlap it, it doesn't really matter because it's going to be shadow on the water. And I don't want a really sharp edge there, although the sun is so bright, the edge is pretty sharp. But see what I mean about the big grid, grid is going away. So I'm going to have to, you know, take all that into consideration. But I, I have a good idea where I'm going with the whole painting. One, one important thing is to not just paint your painting a little bit at a time. Because um, you might be making a mistake. I mean, what I'm saying is if, if, you just, if I just did this whole flower... And all the details in the flower before I even did the rest. I might find that I made some critical error that I didn't know till I started laying out what was around it. 
And um, it's much smarter to just take up the whole painting as a process. So when I get this water in, even if the water's not done, I'm going to fill in the other areas. Also, sometimes something will look different when you see what it relates to in the painting. So it might look too bright initially, but then when you add other bright stuff, it suddenly doesn't look too bright anymore. And you didn't know that until you added the other stuff, because everything is part of everything. Everything that's a part of everything in a way. It's a song that has that in it. It's actually a very nice song. It's a little kid song. It's true, everything is a part of everything. We all work together. It's not thinking of that. Because happiness runs in a circular motion. Life is like a little boat upon the sea. Everything is a part of everything anyway. You can be happy if you let yourself be. I'm not an expert singer, but it's just one of those happy songs. <laughs> so you can paint singing happy songs while you're painting happy water and happy flowers. And the world is at peace and everything is beautiful. And there's no sickness. It's okay to be happy. Even if it's an illusion. <laughs> it's a happy illusion. See, don't you feel like we're making a lot more progress now? Get some color in there. You can tell I'm keeping this real thin. Because I'll probably want to, I'm sure I'll want to go over it. And put layers. Right now I'm just trying to get that canvas covered. And you can see I'm, I'm using a pretty big brush because I don't want a bunch of streaky little lines. I want it all kind of blended. Also trying to make my paint stretch because I got this blob mixed up and it's kind of like that's all there is unless I start trying to figure out exactly what I got mixed up. But my blues are both gone. I got my white mixed in. And I got some nice dark water here. And I'll probably have to mix up more paint. Try to get the same thing. But even in the water, I mean, it might, it looks pretty uniform, but most things in nature are not necessarily uniform, and most things in paintings look better if they're not all uniform. So I'm just going to mix some more blue, get some all terrain, get some Prussian. I don't think I ended up with more Prussian, actually. And I did have some alizarin. I still have the alizarin in there because I didn't use much. The last room it is red. For anybody who might not know that, and it's some white. So I got those blues back in there, one over here, one over here. Get a touch of the room over here, and get some white here, and get some medium because it's getting sticky and stiff. Like a big mess. Hope I have the same color. See, one way I can tell is by going like that. It's pretty close. Close enough. What I'm trying to do is just get this water in. And then that will dry. At this stage, you know, um, this point at which certainly before I put in the lights, it's helpful if that um, the um, raw umber dries. You know, I think this could even be darker. It looks a little bit too light. So I'll just put down more. 
I tend to paint with not much paint on my palette and then just add it a lot. And that's just my upbringing. And Scottish heritage, I've heard. Frugality. But I just don't like waste. And it's a lot easier to refill your palette than put it back in the tube. Now, since I wanted it a little darker, I'm going to just kind of try to mix it in with the white that's already there. You can see this. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a little lighter over there. That last batch I mixed up was just a little light. And like I said, the sun might shine differently there. But I'm just, I didn't add any white this time, but now I'm adding the paint over it and it's mixing it right in. So it's turning the whole thing darker. This is something that is really wonderful about oil paints, being able to mix. And coming back and tweaking things, you know, and they haven't dried, so you can still mix. Drying time can work for you, trust me. I mean, the fact that it takes some time to draw. Okay. See, I can go back here and I can just put all this darker paint on here and just tweak it up, bring it up a little bit. And if I want to um, just darken it, I can put a very thin layer of, of darker blue on here later and just darken up the whole thing without really changing anything except just darkening it up. Another thin layer. Actually, if you put in a lot of thin layers, it can just really build up the, the luxuriance of it. Now, I'm trying to find little corners. There's a little corner here. You don't see it much there because I think there's another lily pad underneath. But I kind of want to see that water, so I'm going to make it blue. And here is a little blue. Getting a little raw umber mixed in here, but... I think the blue is going to trump it. Trump, I don't want to say trump it. Just trump it. Okay. And a little here. And that, where that leaf is. I can say that leaf is weird, but I like it because the color relates to those other colors. And there's a little on this side. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I don't care. Because that leaf is all mangled, and I can do kind of what I want with it. Hardly even looks like a leaf. Okay, where else do I have some? It's actually a little blue here. See if I want a little more blue, I'll put in one more blue. Okay, and there, there are actually some on the other side here. I want to, um, that's that reflection. This is this. That's getting a little dark because I hear I was making it. It's a little darker here, but actually that's farther away and there's more things ar around it. So I'm not going to worry about it because it might actually be darker because of the um, more shadows. But I'm just carefully adding a wee bit of light to my blue mix. So it does look a little bit dark. Okay, let's try this. So even with a big brush, you can use the edge and edge. You just want to use the, the front of edge of your brush for that edge. In other words, if I painted like this, the back end of the, the bristles would control us this front end of the bristles. Okay. Now let me tell you something else about drawing it in and paint. There is a technique in painting that they used to use a lot. Um, Gainsborough, you can tell looking at his paintings, he used it. And what what it involves is taking that initial drawing like we just did. Uh, like in black and white, or you can do it in sepia, more of a sepia redder paint and a white. 
And you just do the whole thing like it was basically a black and white image. Just values, no color. You paint the whole thing in excruciating detail, all in just showing those two, the values, the light and the dark. And then when you're done, you let it dry. And then you take your transparent colors and you just put a wash of that on there. The painting below shines through and you get all your darks and your lights and all your values from the paint below. The problem is when you need a an opaque paint, like skin tone has white in it normally, at least in Caucasians. And um, so that is not going to give you that transparent, the transparency. So you have to go and reinforce some of those, you know, lights and darks when you have to use a, a opaque color. But other than that, it's incredible. It's, it's long to do the initial painting. And then when you, you so fast because you've got all the creations, the darks and the lights are already there and they show through. It's, it's a real interesting technique to try. I did a painting like that once just to see what it was like. Rubens um, kind of broke the cycle of that largely because Rubens had so much work he couldn't you know, have the patience. He says, I'll just put the paint on there. Don't go through all this like painting everything twice. He was so good, he could do it. He also had a lot of helpers that painted the, like backgrounds and things, because he had. Now, I lily pads underneath this neck part. There was a lily pad in here I didn't really put in because it's just a little tiny thing underneath there. The question is, do I really want it? Or maybe I don't want it. This one would go over here and intersect over here without it. It might be an unnecessary lily pad. Question is, this lily pad has to connect up here. If it goes around here and comes here, then this since I'm leaving out one, I just want this to connect with this line. So I'm just going to sketch that to be sure, because if this comes here and this comes here, this would come over here. And it could be this big, long, long lily pad. This, it looks all one in here. It's actually curling up over here. There's a curl here. So there's actually a little bit of underneath the lily pen. But that one could come up like that or, or over like this. It just has to connect here. Maybe if I make this more an angle, but see how important it is to think it through at where this um, lily pad is coming and going and what has to happen in between so that it, so that it makes sense. So I'm just going to do a little tweak. This blue is pretty intense, but if this is coming up, I'm going to take this down. This is a little paint thinner here, because if that's going here, then I want that to be going there. So and it'll go down here, and then it'll go down here, and then I'll maybe I'll just. Move that a little. This this is actually all in through here. It's like curled up. I didn't even see that. This is actually what does it look like here. Do my fact checking here. This actually comes up because um, it comes up more up here and then it goes down. I'm going to make a revision here. 
Again, this is why you draw it out first. So when you see these discrepancies, they're really easy to change right now. It's going to be much harder to change later. But what's happening is, is right in this area, if you can see right here, there's actually an underside of the lily pad here, which you can see in the color version. And it actually comes up, actually this whole thing, we made this overlapping, which is one of the issues that I'm encountering here, because we changed it. And it actually, the shadows are so hard to differentiate. When we paint it, we can, we can separate those shadows from the underside of the actual lily pad more easily. But this is actually coming up here. I'm going to um, change what I did before. Because I didn't see that it was curled here. So now instead of overlapping, I'm pulling it back. And this actually comes like that. And then it'll um, go over and connect over there. Then what happens to that? It's all dark. Dark shadows. And then this is shadow. Dark, dark shadow. But where do I need any more blue in there? No, don't think so. This blue comes up here. And this actually, I'm going to make that go like that. Now, some of this really dark shadow. One of the things that I've mentioned before, I don't know if you remember, is that you can make black out of ultramarine blue and um, burnt umber, burnt umber. There's my ultramarine, couldn't find my ultramarine. And I have, and, and the nice thing about that is when you're making related things, we got water here. This shadow's in the water. And if we can, if we're using a lot of ultramarine in the water, and then we're using ultramarine and the shadows, it's going to create a consistency. So we're going to make those black shadows not exactly black, because they probably aren't. They just look that way in the photo. But we're going to make them ultramarine with some burnt umber in it and push it toward the ultramarine. And I'm going to get it before. So I'm going to work on the shadows a little bit since I've got some burnt umber on my palette and I've got some ultramarine on my palette. And then next week we'll be able to just go right into some of these lighter colors. Without them um, getting too mushed up. Remember what I did here. This is all this tricky part. I just love the way this lily pad kind of swoops over here, curls back on itself. It's like a um, like a piece of pottery almost. Let me this better picture. If you can do this using your computer, it's even better because um, the light's shining through. You'll be able to see the differences between the shadows and the underside of the lily pads easier. See, this is really dark. And then this is where this petal I don't remember exactly what time of year I went and got this picture, but for all of you guys that are in Maryland, you know the um, Patuxent Research Refuge is not far from Savage. If you're in Savage, it's just over, you just go down 
I remember correctly. There's several ways you can get there. You can get there off Powder Mill Road, and there's a, a north track and a south track. And it's in the south track where the visitor center is, and these ponds are. And they have uh, there's all these birds there too. If anybody wants to go bird watching, they open up at dawn, or at least they used to when we lived there. And um. You can get out, oh, there's all these bird watchers out there real early with their long lenses. And there's all these ponds or little lakes with all these, you know, lilies. And it's really a beautiful place and it's quite close to Savage. Right off the, you can get to off the BW Parkway. For those of you who aren't from Maryland, I used to have my art studio at Savage Mill. And Three Gear Studios actually occupies um, part of it, uh, where my art studio was when before we moved. And the game room, they, they're combined with Three Gear Games, which is where the game room for my husband Steve's game store, the family game store, was. Now my son runs them with his wife, Lena, which is... Watching, yay! <laughs> Who is watching, not witches? Get my grammar correct. It's a bit of, bit of local history here. Now, I, I really don't want these real sharp edges, so um, I, uh, it's almost out of time. But what I'm going to do before I clean up is just go through these intersecting edges and take a soft brush I'll just do it now, and I'll just finish up this shadow, and um, I think I'm going to have to close. The time is almost up. I'm looking for a nice soft brush. This will do. And then you can just go by these edges here while they're wet on both sides. And with a soft brush with no paint on it, because it gets paint from all this stuff that we've been, from the paint on that already, uh, already on there. And, um... You just go over those edges and it softens them, which just helps them considerably because they shouldn't be that hard. It just makes them look like cutouts instead of real things. And if you get a little in the blue, it's all wet, you can just blend it. So this probably needs to come over here a little bit more. See how it all blends in. This blue looks like it can't decide what it, it's dark or light. So. There. See how that looks? It looks a lot better. Soft. So anyway, I believe it's nine. My clock says about a minute till nine. And I, I think my clock is just a little bit not quite having the right time. And my phone is not telling me what time it is. But I'm supposed to end at nine. And I think it's nine. So I'm going to have to end. So this is part one. You can see how far we got. We spent a lot of time blocking it out, but you got to have the drawing in there one way or the other. And um, so be back and we're going to work on getting some of the lighter colors in, getting the lily pads and getting the flower get going. So come back and join us. We'll see you then. Bye.